tonight. Expecting parents are concerned as the Saskatchewan Health Authority warns of pending epidural shortages. Also, game on. COVID-19 cases pushes the Saskatchewan Rough Riders game against the Toronto Argonauts to Sunday. Plus, it's one of the most recognizable symbols of summer. Now, the monarch butterfly is considered just two steps away from extinction. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Thursday, July 21st, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for watching. Hospitals across Saskatchewan are preparing for a shortage of epidurals. The kits are used primarily by anesthesiologists to manage pain during childbirth and caesarean sections. The Saskatchewan Health Authority says the shortage is due to supply chain issues. Laura Sharpaletti reports. Kristen Walker is looking forward to adding another child to her family this October. Wednesday night, the Regina mom of one got news she couldn't have predicted that there may not be an epidural available for her when that time comes. Walker says the birth of her first child involved 10 hours of labor, tearing and other complications. If not for an epidural, she would have had to have an emergency C-section. There was a lot of tearing and cutting um, that I would have all otherwise had to experience and feel. I was really hoping to count on getting one again. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little stressed out about that option possibly going away. Walker says she has confidence the Saskatchewan Health Authority is doing everything in its power to get more supply. Expectant moms are asked to review their pain management options with their care providers. The SHA says alternative pain control methods include medications through spinal, inhaled, intravenous or intramuscular injection. One Saskatoon doctor admits that also comes with risks. But we are well prepared for those risks and we are collaborating across the system, keeping our colleagues who may be dealing with those risks well informed so that everybody's prepared. Regina Dula, Amy Runro says many mothers are feeling anxious and worried by the potential shortage. She says there are ways to adjust a birth plan if epidurals aren't available, including things like hypnotherapy. You're expecting right now and you have time to take a hypnotherapy class. There are some offered in our city and I think that would be a fantastic um, alternative method. There are some other options that you can use for pain management um, medically at the hospital, like the nitrous oxide gas. Um, sometimes you can use morphine. The SHA could not provide information as to how many epidurals are left in the province. Health officials say they are working hard to understand why there are supply chain issues. And the president of the Canadian Anesthesiologist Association says this is a problem that's not just in our country. We're suspicious um, that it is going to be a global supply uh, chain issue. As for the expected mamas, Monroe has some advice as they head into an uncertain future. A reminder that they are strong. Your body was made to have babies. You can do it. Laura Sharpaletti, CBC News, Regina. COVID-19 hospitalizations are up in Saskatchewan, ending months of decline. Today, the Saskatchewan government released new COVID data for the first time in nearly a month. The report covers the period of June 26th to July 16th. It shows 229 COVID hospital admissions during that time, working out to about 76 hospitalizations per week. 15 people were under intensive care and 22 more people have died due to COVID-19. 14 of those deaths were during the reporting period. The rest happened in previous months but hadn't been reported yet. The Saskatchewan Union of Nurses is sounding the alarm, saying the health system is overwhelmed and could collapse. We just need to acknowledge that we are at an untenable situation in Saskatchewan healthcare. If we layer another increase in COVID admissions on top of the system that is already in crisis or in constant stress, that we run a real risk that our system could collapse. The province says as people spend more time indoors in the fall, we may see an extended COVID peak. The Omicron BA4 and BA5 subvariants are now the dominant strains in Saskatchewan. The Rough Riders and Argonauts will go ahead with their game this weekend, just not when it was originally scheduled. To give the Riders another day to get through COVID protocols, the game will be played Sunday night at Mosaic Stadium, not Saturday. 
It was definitely a short staffed riders team that hit the field this afternoon, not including their injured and the two suspended players. 11 players were absent because of COVID-19 with Cody Fajardo nursing a sore knee and Mason Fine under COVID protocols. That left third stringer Jake Dolagala as the lone quarterback. He could be the starter come Sunday at five o'clock. It was strange for sure, you know, uh, just even individuals, you know, warming up by myself, having really, you know, usually we're chatting amongst cues and uh, it, was different. it was different. We, you know, we, we got a lot of new faces out there and uh, you're going to see guys play that haven't played yet this year, but, you know, we're going to, we're going to put a team out there and we expect to play well and, and do what we do. So we're, we're playing to win the game just like we would if, if we had everybody that was, uh, you know, so, so-called starters out there. Well, he hasn't told me much, to be honest. I'm just preparing every day like I will be the starter. Um, and, you know, it's coach's call at the end of the day. Mason's in protocol, but Cody's knee is, is the issue. So we'll just decide on game day who, who we want to be the backup. It'll be either Mason or Cody. The six foot seven Dolagala has spent time with four NFL teams, mostly with the Cincinnati Bengals, but he's never started a professional game. And that could happen Sunday night when the Riders host the Argos. Kickoff 24 hours later, but it will be at five o'clock. The province is giving Saskatchewan school divisions an extra $20 million. The education minister says it's a 1% increase to the roughly $2 billion that schools are receiving this year. And he says things have changed since the budget was released. School divisions had until the end of June to submit a budget. So, we, you know, we've, uh, we haven't had um, that much time with the actual budgets. Um, we did know, though, that uh, they had been expressing concerns about um, the, the fact that they were going to have to transfer dollars um, potentially away from the classroom into things like fuel, uh, into things like insurance. And so, you know, I think that this is just an opportunity now that all the budgets have been submitted. Uh, we know what they're actually dealing with in terms of the decisions that they've, that they've uh, had, uh, you know, had to make uh, as, a part of, uh, as a part of their budget deliberations uh, and a better sense of where we are as a province. Duncan says 15 million of the funding will go toward transportation costs. The remainder will go toward increased insurance premiums. In a statement, NDP leader Carla Beck says this funding is a quote drop in the bucket that will only cover shortfalls at six of the 27 school divisions. Days ahead of the papal visit to Alberta, there are mixed emotions in the community of Muscatese. It's one of the stops on the Pope's visit. Some see it as an opportunity to begin healing. Others say it serves little purpose other than to reopen old wounds. Stephen Cook has more. Preparations are underway for the papal visit to Muscatese next week. Pope Francis is expected to deliver an apology for the Catholic Church's role in residential schools. Because we know that this is where, you know, the residential school... For Lucy Johnson, whose parents both attended residential schools, the visit is a source of frustration. Deep down, I'm mad on what happened with my father. I would love to have my father be part of it, but we lost him to, to the, uh, addiction, the addictions that happened because of what happened to him in residential school. And I will never bring my father back. Johnson's mother, however, went on to become an influential educator and even has a school named after her. She thrived by some of the abuses that she went through by going to school and, and that was her way of saying residential school is not going to kill me. Johnson herself has been a court worker around Muskwachis for 25 years. She says she still sees the intergenerational effects of residential schools but hasn't yet seen any perpetrators face justice. Where's the accountability? It just can't be shoved under the corner and say sorry. Somebody needs to be held responsible. Others in the community, however, see the papal visit as a chance to begin healing. I'm hoping and I'm praying that it's a step forward to, to healing for our people. Even, um, and, and I don't want to say anything to, you know, to um, hurt those that are, are, who are finding it difficult to forgive. Um, but I also pray that they too have a, an open heart and, you know, um, and try to forgive. And, and begin the healing process. I hope people understand that, you know, we're, we're all in this, um, that it's okay to feel the way you're feeling. Little Child hopes the apology will also help change Canadian attitudes towards Indigenous peoples, a shift needed to fulfill the peace and intent of treaty. What do you do next? 
that's that's what matters. Stephen Cook, CBC News, Musquatchies. A Saskatchewan First Nation is dealing with flooding tonight after heavy rain earlier this week washed out a nearby road. Over 100 millimeters of rain destroyed culverts running beneath Township Road 210. That's in the arm of Edenwald, about 65 kilometers northeast of Regina. The rushing water also caused the evacuation of seven homes on the Muscopeding Soto Nation. About 50 volunteers came out yesterday to help sandbag. Thankfully, there is another grid road in and out of the First Nation. But one of Muscopeding's emergency coordinators says this is a first for his community. I do remember in the 70s when the Kapal River overflowed, it affected two houses and we we done the same. We came out and we had a sandbag, a sandbag a team to sandbag and save the homes, right? But, but nothing like this where it's actually high rise rushing water. The washed out road also resulted in three people being injured early this morning. The First Nation says a car carrying a trio plunged into water around 2 a.m. It's believed the driver ignored signs warning the road was damaged. Muscopeding security and Stars Air Ambulance arrived on scene shortly after. All three were taken to hospital. Their conditions not known at this time. The Water Security Agency expects dry weather in the forecast to help water levels recede in the coming days. WestJet workers in Calgary and Vancouver have voted to strike as early as next week if they can't reach a new contract with the airline. The union for more than 700 baggage handlers and service agents say they haven't had a raise in five years. Many say they're burned out and facing verbal abuse from customers over flight delays and cancellations. WestJet workers voted 98% in favour of a strike if a deal is not reached. It puts them in strike position by next Wednesday, July 27th. WestJet management says it's committed to reaching a deal. Well, it was another nice day in southern Saskatchewan. But what's to come? Ethan will have a preview of the weekend forecast coming up after the break. Stay with us. A true symbol of summer here in Canada has been put on the endangered list. The monarch butterfly is now considered just two steps away from extinction by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Kitty Nicholson explains. Pat Concessi has tried to make her Toronto garden as butterfly friendly as possible. There are purple pollinators and flowers that bloom late into fall. Because the monarchs need to, to collect enough nectar to get the energy to make their migration back to Mexico. And big rocks to shelter them from the wind and keep them warm. They retain their heat and butterflies have a challenge with maintaining their body temperature. So I will often come out and find butterflies sitting on the rock. Despite her best efforts today, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature added the monarch butterfly to its red list and categorized it as endangered nearing extinction because its population has shrunk between 22 and 72 percent over the last decade, threatened by habitat destruction and climate change. Canada hasn't yet listed the monarch as endangered, but conservation groups have been keeping a close eye on it. Changes in crops and pesticides have eliminated large amounts of milkweed, a vital source for the monarchs. One of the most, most important things that has contributed to their decline is the loss of milkweed. And here in Canada, uh, we can help support the monarch butterfly by, by planting more milkweed and by planting more native species that they depend on. That helps, but part of the reason the population is in peril is climate change. Monarch numbers are really tied to variation in year-to-year -year weather and that the conditions that are best for monarchs are becoming more rare. So um, the hot and dry conditions are not good for them. Butterflies need a source of water, as do many of the flying insects. So I just keep a, a, a pan of water there. Still, Concessi believes every little bit helps, even in a small patch of urban greenery. 
like many people my age, I think about the world that I grew up in and how different the world my grandchildren are growing up in. And if there's something I can do to, um, to slow the pace of, of species extinction, that's something I want to do. Got a butterfly coming right through. Small changes, not just for the butterflies, but her grandchildren too. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. This weather update is brought to you by Capital GMC Buick Cadillac. The exclusive export event is back. It feels late in the show to get to him, but weather specialist Ethan Williams joins me now. No severe weather to speak of? Or are you enjoying the calmer weather? Well, you know, I was thinking about this. Last couple of days, uh, well, the first couple of days of that uh, calmer weather was really nice, especially, you know, filling in on the desk. Didn't have to worry about uh, running around trying to get weather warnings or anything. Now I'm a little worried I'm going to get bored. <laughs> I don't think that's a problem. I don't think so. I think, so. I think we'll, we'll just give it 24 hours and things will uh, start going off again. But, you know, we've had some uh, this all this beautiful weather in the province has made for some pretty nice photo opportunities. And uh, that is what Carolyn had the opportunity to do up at Sturgeon Lake Regional Park. Gorgeous sunset through uh, the clouds there. It's a little rainier, though, in DeChambeau Lake, where Jean grabbed this shot, but a beautiful double rainbow coming out as the clouds cleared there. And uh, there are some clouds in DeChambeau Lake this evening, uh, which is just east of Larange. It is sitting at 17 degrees under cloudy conditions there. And a wide spread of temperatures uh, across the province this evening. Just 12 in Collins Bay, but it's 18 degrees warmer in Maple Creek, where you are still sitting at the 30 degree mark. No humidex values to speak of this evening there though, thankfully. And through much of south and central, mid to upper 20s, 27 in Regina, 26 in Saskatoon. Again, still really hot in that southwest corner. Leader sitting at 29 degrees degrees, pardon me, right now, and it is pretty gusty on the eastern part of the province. We're looking at gusts up to 40 kilometers an hour in Yorkton. Wasn't quite, hasn't been quite as gusty as it was yesterday when those uh, winds out of the northwest gusted between 50 and 60 kilometers an hour, but nonetheless, those are going to uh, start to move out as uh, we head through the night. Now, we have had some nice warm weather, and if you're wondering if that's going to be sticking around, well, the good news is Environment Canada says through the rest of this month, into August and into September, looks like there is a pretty good chance. Places like Regina, Saskatoon, looking at a 40 to 50 percent chance. If you're in Swift Current, Maple Creek, Lloyd Minster, La Ronge, Prince Albert, there's an even better chance. And really, it's the north of the province where we're seeing the highest percentages for uh, the chance of above normal temperatures. Uh, La Loche, Collins Bay, Key Lake, Uranium City, Stony rapids. We don't know how much warmer things are going to be, but likely temperatures will remain on the higher side. Now, there will be some rain in the far north as well. That has been, it's been raining there all day today, and that will start to move out as we head through the overnight hours. But another, another system possibly bringing some showers and thunderstorms tomorrow. South and central possibly and in the Churchill region, those move through tomorrow afternoon, but those will likely stay on the non-severe side of things. Saturday should be a mostly clear day, save for a couple pop-up showers here and there. Winds tomorrow, not as bad as they have been past couple of days. Highest gusts will be in between the 30 to 40 kilometer an hour range, and we will hardly notice them on Saturday, especially western part of the province and the far north nearly calm conditions uh, on uh, Saturday and through the rest of the weekend. Our uh, extended forecast in Regina, a little on the cool side for temperatures, especially Saturday, Sunday. At least it'll be clear and not really windy, but getting down to 20 degrees, that is not what we've been used to for uh, this time of year. Saskatoon, your temperatures will be a little warmer. 40% chance of some showers and thunderstorms tomorrow, and then the warm-up uh, starts to uh, come back a little bit as we head through the rest of the week. And, uh, you know, Sam, I'm not seeing severe weather on, the, on that map right now, but uh, like I say, maybe uh, 24 hours from now, it'll be a whole different situation. All right, well, we'll talk 24 hours from now. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan. Sounds good. You bet. Well, if you're looking for a way to celebrate a birthday or another special occasion, you could always immerse yourself in slime. A venue in New York is dedicated to the gooey substance. The Slumu Institute has attractions ranging from a slime wall and a giant slime lake to a glow-in-the-dark slime cave. The co-founder says they focus on everything related to sensory play. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. The January 6th committee is holding what's likely to be the final public hearing of summer 
tonight. Testimony will focus on the actions of former President Donald Trump as rioters stormed the Capitol. Kate Fisher reports. 187 minutes. That's the time between when former President Donald Trump made a rousing speech to his supporters on the ellipse. Let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. Until he posted a video on Twitter calling on them to leave the Capitol. Go home. It's well known how most of the day unfolded, but for more than three hours, Mr. Trump himself went dark. The committee says that tonight it will reveal what was going on inside the White House as a mob attacked the US Capitol. Two former Trump aides will offer insight, former National Security Council member Matthew Pottinger and one-time Deputy White House Press Secretary Sarah Matthews. They both resigned in the aftermath of the insurrection. The committee will also show outtakes from a speech to the nation that Mr Trump recorded on January the 7th, the day after the violence. Well, the, the president um, displayed extreme difficulty in completing his remarks, of course, you know, hours had passed when he could have simply taken a walk uh, for 10 or 15 seconds over to address the country and address his followers and tell them to go home. And people were beseeching him, begging him to do that. Committee members have said that tonight's hearing will offer the most compelling evidence yet of Donald Trump's, quote, dereliction of duty. But as yet, the Justice Department has not decided whether there is enough evidence to bring criminal charges against the former president. Look, no person is above the law in this country. Nothing stops us. Even a former president. No, I don't know how to maybe I'll say that again. No person is above the law in this country. I can't say it any more clearly than that. There is nothing in the principles of prosecution in any other fact. Tonight's hearing is the last to be scheduled, but the panel has left the door open for more, and it hopes to publish a final report in the autumn. Kate Fisher for CBC News, Washington. U.S. President Joe Biden has tested positive for COVID-19. The results were revealed by the White House this morning. Biden is reported to be experiencing very mild symptoms and is being treated with antiviral medication. He remains on the job but is isolating himself until he tests negative. Biden is 79, fully vaccinated, and has received two booster shots. And Ethan is back with one last look at tonight's weather. Is it boring? Uh, it is, thankfully. I think that's good news anyway. In Regina, where we will be close to 10 degrees as we head overnight. But we'll quickly warm up tomorrow morning. 17 uh, southeast winds not too bad in the morning. Mainly sunny conditions. We get to noon and those winds will increase a little bit out of the north to about 24 kilometers an hour. We're looking at partly cloudy conditions, 23 degrees. Saskatoon, we may see some showers tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. 17, they won't last long though because as we head into the afternoon hours, We'll see some partly cloudy conditions. We'll get some sun and cloud uh, heading through the rest of the day. Back to Batoche days began today. And if you're heading to the entertainment there this evening, well, it'll be quite nice. 23 with uh, mostly sunny conditions at 730. Winds will be a little breezy, but nothing boring about that event, Sam. Not at all. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. And that is it from us tonight for News Anytime. You can always head to cbc.ca slash ask or subscribe to the CBC Saskatchewan YouTube channel. Glenn Reid will be back with more local news at 11. Thanks for watching and have a great night.